everyone. Welcome to Stop, Drop, and Knit. My name is Lisa, and I am coming to you from Long Island, New York. I think this is episode 25 now, which seems like a kind of big number. 25, that's, that's a pretty big milestone. So hi, thank you guys all so much for supporting my podcast. Everybody who has been with me before, thank you so much for your support and welcome back. And if you're new here, hi, welcome. My name is Lisa. I talk to you guys about my knitting and spinning and natural dye projects. I don't usually have all of those things going on every week. I shoot for two out of the three. So today we're going to be visiting my knitting projects and I have um, some fun natural dyeing that I did over the past week to share with you all today. So I'm trying to squeeze the recording of today's episode in before the rain starts coming in about an hour to 90 minutes. I think I'm gonna be good. It's very humid in the air. We've got some thunderstorms scheduled to start at about two o'clock here today. So I think I'm gonna be good. Um, hopefully this doesn't get cut short because of some sudden rain happening, but we'll see. So as always, let's start the podcast off with what am I wearing today? Okay, today I am wearing my Tanya sweater again. This is a pattern by Caitlin Hunter and I knit this one in Lambstrings yarn. Um, I love this sweater. You guys have seen it before. I don't have too many spring garments, so this is one that I wear frequently, but I absolutely love this lace section and I love the uh, lambstrings yarn and how it worked up in this pattern. I think the name of the color that I used was Petunia and it was in Shanna's uh, Sadie Singles base. So yeah, if you guys haven't heard of Lambstrings Yarn, I'm gonna link her below in the show notes. As with everything else that I discussed today, it'll be down in the description bar below this video. So if you haven't heard of Lambstrings Yarn, Shanna does some amazing colorways. She's got a great eye for color. I think she has some background in art and painting maybe, which then led her into dyeing. So um, yeah, she definitely has a unique uh, sense of color and I just love the way that her yarns work up. So that's what I'm wearing today. It's my Tanya by Caitlin Hunter. So you might've caught in my last podcast that I do actually have a finished object. So let's go into finished objects. So those socks, Last week I had a second sock syndrome and I, I have had these socks on the needles since Easter. These are my Easter socks in Jelly Bean Remix by Knitterly Things. I finally finished the second sock, you guys. So here they are. They are finished. I am so excited. I can't wear them now. So these will be put off until the fall. It's just, it's too hot for socks. It's just humid and I did wear some uh, hand knit socks yesterday, but they were cotton. I think they're like the one pair of cotton socks that I own and I love them. They're not, the cotton ones are, they don't keep my feet warm in the winter. So I don't ever wear them in the winter. They're just, they're too cold. But when it starts to be too warm to wear the wool socks, those are perfect. Um, it's like the perfect balance, the cotton ones. So I think I do want to knit some more socks in cotton. I'll have to show you guys those at some point. Um, but I'm not gonna show them right now because I just wore them yesterday and so they're stinky. And you guys don't wanna see my stinky socks on a podcast for sure. So let's get back to these, <laughs> let's get back to these socks which are not stinky because I've not worn them yet. So, okay. The pattern that I used for these socks is by uh, My Knitted Heart. It's My Knitted Heart Vanilla Socks and I think I think, I always forget the designer's name. I think it's Elizabeth Suarez is the designer. And so it's a really, it's a free pattern. So I'm gonna, you know, I'll have that, my Ravelry project page linked below for it. But, um, so the front, the top portion of the sock, you can see it's stuck in net, but there's a little bit of ribbing detail on the sides. And that goes all the way up the leg of the sock. Um, and then 
so so these were knit uh, cuff down. I've never done toe up socks. It's kind of on my list of things, but I just I've just never tried it. I need to try some things. Um, yeah, out of you guys, guys let me know. Um, are you team cuff down or team toe up, and why? And if you guys are toe up sock knitters, can you guys recommend a good pattern for me to start on? Because I think I need to try it. I don't see why I couldn't I couldn't do it. It's just a different way of knitting socks. So yeah, so send a good uh, toe up pattern my way so that I can just give it a shot and see what I think of it. I hear it's a really good way to use up your yarn completely. So that might be really cool. Um, but yeah, getting back to these, um, so these are cuffed down and you do the ribbing and then you keep a portion of the ribbing and travel the ribbing down the entire sock until the toe. So for my feet, this pattern is so great because I've got super narrow, super tiny feet. And so just having a little bit of ribbing continuing all the way down the sock really helps fit my feet much better. And so, um, the heel, the gusset, um, the heel flap, that's what I was trying to say. The heel flap is a slip stitch heel flap and just a traditional heel turn. And so I used a contrasting color for my heel and toe. Also came with my yarn. So these were the, uh, I have so much left over and Owen doesn't, I don't think he wants this color. He's not interested in it. There's too much. It's too much pink, I think he said, for this one. So um, I just, I have a ton of it left over. And this was the contrasting color. So this one is Jelly Bean Remix from April 2020 from her Remix Sock Club. And this is Plum, I think, let me check. Jelly Bean Remix with 20 gram Plum Mini. Yeah, so I have so much left over still not sure what this will be at some point maybe like a pair of really tiny socks for a new kid or something so these are finally off the needles you guys i am so happy that these are done i love them i don't know why i was struggling so much to like finish that second sock i don't usually struggle i usually just zip through them but yeah a good six weeks at least on these socks since i cast on on easter so I am very glad to not have to show you guys these on the podcast again. And usually, usually when I cast off a pair of socks, I cast a new pair right on right away. I have not done that yet because I have a whole bunch of other things going on and I think, um, I, like I kind of want to have a pair of socks going, but I'm also kind of not feeling the sock knitting right now because I'm, yeah, I'm just feeling other things. So. Yeah, I have an idea of what yarn I want to use for my next pair of socks. I got this really cool like um, purple, like a deep purple with like a fluorescent yellow speckles in it that is called fireflies. And I think because it's June now and this is like when the fireflies are going to start popping out here, I was thinking of maybe casting that yarn on and starting to knit on that next. So. I think I'm gonna try to do that because I do always like to have socks going on. Okay, so that is all the finished objects I have this week. Let's move on to whips. Okay, so speaking of it being June, that means that we are officially, we have officially started our Harry Potter Knitting Magic Knit Along. So cast on day was June 1st and you don't have to cast on on June 1st. Obviously you guys can join in at any time. Um, yeah, so I announced the, the knit along and I have cast on Hedwig. So I'm gonna dig that out. Um, but yeah, I've got a Ravelry thread now going for the knit along. So you can look for the Harry Potter knit along thread in my Stop, Drop and Knit podcast group on Ravelry. And then the hashtag that we are using on Instagram, cause I'm gonna have it on Instagram too, since Ravelry is not accessible to everybody, is hashtag 
Harry Potter Knit Along 2021. So I wanted to differentiate between just, there was already a Harry Potter Knit Along hashtag. There wasn't much there, but I just wanted to like put the 2021 there so it was like clear that it was a brand new, a brand new thing. Okay, so I cast on Hedwig and I'm not very far in, but let me, let me get to it. And I got spoiler alerted because I haven't seen all the movies yet. So I was so annoyed. Um, I'm not going to spoiler alert you guys if you have not seen all the movies. But in the pattern description, talking about Hedwig, there was a spoiler alert. And I, I'm only up to, I'm like midway through movie five. I cannot get Owen to show me the rest of movie five. He just wants to watch like the last movie and Chamber of Secrets over and over again. It's like movie two or like the second part of movie eight. And I'm like, Owen, I need to still finish watching movie five and then see movie six and movie seven before I can watch the last movie. I don't know why he doesn't understand that. But I was reading, I was reading the description here of the pattern and there is a spoiler alert. So if you have not seen movie seven i think it was from movie seven don't read the description <laughs> because i got i got spoiler alerted so anyway i cast on hedwig and i have him in this little bag here and i'm not very far um I'm trying to get this out of here so i am using some malabrigo rios in just an undyed natural color because that was what they had at my yarn shop. And I started the body. And so I have done, I, I, this was whatever I knit on on Tuesday and I haven't gotten back to it since then. So this is all that I have. I feel like the camera in this light is really blowing out today. So I'm sorry about that. But I, can't, I just can't wait until the sun is in a different place because of the rain that's coming. So, so this is what we've got. So I am on my size four double point needles, which I had to get because I did not have size four double pointed needles. I had lower, really small because of socks, and then I had like seven and up. So I had to go to the store and get a pair of needles for this pattern, and I'm really liking the fabric that it is producing so far. I think it is not going to be, see it's really blowing out. I think, yeah, I don't know. So yeah, not super far. Definitely doesn't look like Hedwig yet, but it's been cast on and I'm gonna aim to, I think for me personally, Owen wants like all three of the stuffed animals, which is Hedwig, the Cornish Pixie, and the three-headed fluffy dog, which I know somebody else said they were gonna cast that one on very soon in the Ravelry thread. So I'm so excited to see that. I think what I'm gonna do is aim to knit, have all of three of those knit over the course of the summer and try to have one done a month. So like Hedwig will be my June project and I'm, I'm really gonna push to have Hedwig done by the end of June. And then a different one, whichever one he wants next for um, July and then whatever the third one is for August. And then at that point, we will be at the end of the summer and I can start casting some accessories like a scarf or some socks or uh, a sweater on for him for the fall and the winter. So um, yeah, I think that that's gonna be my plan is to knock out these three stuffed animals over the course of the summer. So Hadwig is up first. So hopefully I will have much more progress on this done for next time to show you guys. Cause definitely it doesn't look like anything yet. So, but I have heard that his head shaping is a pain in the ass. So I think that there are videos out there from the people who have uh, already made Hadwig that can help with that so if any of you guys are working on Hadwig um, if Ravelry is accessible to you go check out the other projects that people have done already because some of them really talk about the head shaping and I know that I saw that there is a link to like a tutorial video on on how to better manage it so hopefully that'll be helpful to you guys all right 
So that is the status of Hedwig for the Harry Potter knit along. So I hope that some of you guys will join in because it's gonna be a lot of Harry Potter knitting going on. Owen is obsessed telling you. But yes, if you've not seen movie seven, don't read the description. I'm kind of hesitant to like read the descriptions of the other things now until I see all of the rest of the movies. So fair warning, yeah. Um, all right, so that is that one. Next up, I wanna go into some really, really exciting news. Um, yeah, I have some exciting news to share with you guys. I actually found out right before I recorded last week's podcast, but I didn't wanna say anything because I wanted to wait until they announced it on social media. But I am one of nine fiber artists who have been selected to be a brand ambassador for Wonderland Yarn and Fibers. And I am so, so excited. Um, hold on a second, because I should go grab the yarn that I made so I can refresh your memory. Hang on. Okay, sorry about that. I am back. I wanted to grab this yarn that I spun. So if you guys... Oops, I just dropped some. If you guys remember a couple months ago, this is the, the fiber that I was spinning on my drop spindle to make this beautiful yarn. This is Frabjus Fibers. And so it's Wonderland Yarns and Frabjus Fibers. They have um, an amazing variety of superwash yarn and it's all hand dyed in the most amazing colors. It's all based on Alice in Wonderland, which is, it's really fun for me right now because Owen, the show that he is doing in his theater right now is Alice in Wonderland Jr. And he is playing Cheshire Cat number one <laughs> this time. So it's so funny, like the Cheshire Cat role in the play is split between three kids and it's really complicated. These kids are so young and then, it's like they they share all the dialogue and it's split like so one of them has a few words the next has the next few and the, like so it's it's kind of if one kid is a little bit slow or doesn't remember something then it like kind of throws the whole thing off so we'll see how that goes but yeah so so that's really fun so it's it's just a really really exciting thing and a fun thing for me to be a part of because i it's been like alice in wonderland everything here lately with Owen's show. Um, and so I wanted to just refresh your memory of some of the products that I have shown you guys in the past that I have done some work on. Um, they're gonna be sending me some yarn and I think some fiber too, maybe not together, to play with and to, you know, to promote their products because that's gonna be my role as brand ambassador. But they have, a whole variety of yarn. They have a, a amazing variety of hand painted fibers and um, for either spinning or needle felting projects. And they have um, some needle felted like notions, that pouches and things like that. So you guys, oh, they also hand dye uh, silk ribbon and things. So there's just, there's so many beautiful projects. Their colors are incredible. They are based in Brattleboro, Vermont, and I'm pretty sure that they only have an online store. I do not think that they have a shop that is open to the public, um, but you can find their products in a lot of yarn shops. So you can go check out their website and it'll have a list of the shops that carry their products there. So you can go see if there is one close to you. Um, and if there is, you can go to your yarn shop and check them out or you can order online. So I will be linking probably all the time now to Wonderland Yarns and Fibers um, just for you guys to have easy access to that. But this is the, this is a BFL, a Blue Face Luster yarn that I have recently spun up on my drop spindle. This was my second ever yarn that I made and it's so beautiful. The colors are me. They are very me. Teals and fuchsia and purple. It's it's just and it's so lovely. Um, and so I wanted to bring that out to to show you guys. So this is Frabjus Fibers. 
and I'm thrilled with that. Uh, and then, so this is a whip. So we are in whips. This is a whip that I have set aside and I really need to return to. Um, and I feel like I have a little motivation now to return to it. I was kind of setting it aside because of the change in weather and also because this was a test knit that I was working on and none of us met the deadline for it. And um, I, just, I just need to get back to it sometime and I wanna try to finish this you know, in time for the fall. So this is Artist Journey and this is a sweater pattern that I have been test knitting for Annie Lepton. And at this point, it's just a UFO that I need to bring back to being an active whip. Um, but this yarn is so beautiful. So um, I just, I love all of the colors in it. It's so pretty. And so I have them all here. So I just wanted to show you guys again. Okay, so this is their Mad Hatter base, which is a sport weight yarn. And it's 344 yards of 100% superwash merino. And so this color is Frippery 189. This is the label. And, and I don't think I've ever shown you guys this outside in the natural light. So this is what it looks like in the skein. It's so pretty. It's like a, a color I think that would work on so many people. It is gray with all of these jewel tone color speckles. And so that's, um, that's what I have been using, you know, for the main color sections of this sweater. And I just love how it has all the speckles in there that helps kind of connect the color work section to the regular main body fabric. Okay, and then uh, my color work sections, I purchased two of these because I needed um, more yardage than just one, but not enough yardage to warrant buying a full skein of each of these colors. So they sell also mini, mini, cannot talk, mini skein packs of yarn and they sell them in like groups of five minis or this one was a group of eight so this one also came with uh with this color green in it so that looks like that and this one is also the mad hatter base which is the sport weight yarn and this each skein has 86 yards um and all eight skeins together is a total of 688 yards. So I needed more than 86, but obviously I didn't need like full skeins. And this color is Rhyme and Reason number 82. So these were all the jewel tones that I chose for the color work sections of the sweater. So, yeah, so this is this is my Wonderland yarns and fibers project. So obviously I purchased all of this yarn myself. Um, so I was already, this is the first time I've worked with Wonderland yarns was for this sweater. And I just, the colors are absolutely incredible. As you can see by my project bags and my yarn here, I love, fuchsia pink and purple and this color blue. So I was really uh, inspired by that collection of jewel tone mini skeins. So that, yeah. And then I searched after I chose the mini skein colors, then I went and I searched for a main base, uh, a color, I um, cannot talk, a main color to use that would go with all of them. And so when I found Frippery and saw all of the speckles of the similar jewel tone colors, I just, I was sold. And I couldn't be more pleased. I purchased that yarn a few months ago, sight unseen, just ordered online and just crossed my fingers that the colors would go together. And it is just, it is just gorgeous. So, yeah, so I, I am thrilled. I am so excited about becoming a brand ambassador. Um, so you guys are gonna be seeing more projects. Um, 
you guys are going to be seeing more projects made with Wonderland yarns and Frabjus fibers in future podcasts. So I'm really excited to share those with you. All right, so I'm going to be returning to this and trying to finish it little by little. So the front is all done and I have to do the back, the top part of the back so that I can then uh, get the rest of the body done and seam the shoulders together and then it'll be sleeves and neckband. So I still have quite a bit to go on this sweater. So, I mean, this was a slow, this was a slow knit because of all the twisted stitches in the stitch pattern section here. I don't know how well you guys can see that. That's the one thing with using the speckled yarn in a texture stitch is that it, the speckles kind of, because it's not a completely solid color, it kind of takes away a little bit from the stitch pattern, but thankfully what it does is it also camouflages the little mistakes that I made. So I, I just love it. I think it's perfect and I'm thrilled and yeah, so I'm gonna get back to working on this one. A little bit here and a little bit there and all right, so that's my news. So I'm so excited about that. All right, more whips. I feel like I have so many things to talk about today with whips. Okay, so next up is my test knit for Caitlin Hunter and this is a lacy summer tee that has not yet been named. So I don't think she's just gonna name it Lacey Summer Tea because all of her patterns have much more interesting names. But I wanted to give you an update on how this one is going. I am loving this one so much. Oh, my needle is stuck in the lace. Hang on, hang on. Oh boy, uh-oh. Oh, all right, <laughs> saved it. Okay, let me just make sure this is not gonna fall off the needles. And, all right, so I have added, I have added two more stripes since last time. So now you guys can see like how all of the colors are playing together and I am so beyond thrilled with this. Look at this, this is so, Pretty. I love these colors. Oh my goodness. I am so, so happy with this. Okay, so I'm gonna show you. I did remember to bring the extra mini skein package. So again, I, I, I'm not gonna end up needing this because I still have, let me dig it out here. I finished, now I know now what I, what is required for this having finished both of the plum, the deep plum colored stripes. So I still have this much left. So I was, I was okay. Um, each of these mini skeins is 133 yards. And you know, so I was just, I was a little bit worried going into this test knit that my pack of mini skeins maybe wasn't going to be enough yardage because Caitlin hadn't finished her knitting up her design yet I think when when they announced the test she was about about where I am except one last stripe I think she had knit like one of each color stripe and so she didn't know like exactly an estimate for the yardage and so they were trying to estimate and you know kind of giving an overestimate just to play it safe and so I was I was like really close and I just wasn't sure so I am using Backyard Fibers, Backyard Fiber Works, Backyard Fiber Works, and I picked up this cute little mini skein set at the 2018 Maryland Sheep and Wool, which was the first one that I went to. I went to the 2018 and 2019 Maryland Sheep and Wool, and I picked up this cute little mini skein set from Backyard Fiber Works, and then I never used it. It's been sitting in my stash. And I only picked up one, so why do I have this other one? Because I was really concerned I wasn't gonna have enough yardage. And so I went on Ravelry and I searched for other people who had this and I found somebody who had it listed for sale who was trying to do some de-stashing. 
And so I went ahead and I picked this up from her. I paid, you know, full price from what she paid for it. And she shipped it to me and it was great because I just didn't want to be worried for a test knit about, oh gosh, like I'm just not gonna have enough yarn. So I'm not gonna end up needing this, but I had bought this because a sample that they had in the booth was this, um, a cowl by Kathleen Dames, I think maybe a urchin cowl, or I don't remember the exact name of it. And um, I couldn't remember, I knew that there was a cowl that I had wanted to knit up, but I didn't know the name of the pattern. And so then when I was searching for this, um, they, they had asked her to, to make a pattern for this mini skein set specifically in these colors and so there were a few shops that had years ago advertised the pattern and this together so I was able to see what the pattern is I'll insert it here so I'm gonna be able to knit that up now also because I'm not gonna have to dip into this so I'm actually pretty excited about that it's like I used my stash so guys join my uh, my Ravelry group I've got to stop drop and knit your stash thread going in there. So many of you have been participating in that and I have been going through and seeing all of your projects. It is great. So I'm technically, I'm technically using stash <laughs> for this test knit, but I also kind of repurchased my stash. Does it count? I think it counts still because this was my stash for years and now this is new stash replacement stash I only bought it again because I was concerned about having enough yardage for the test knit so um, yeah so I don't I don't think that you can still find backyard fiber works unless like your local yarn shop still happens to have it in stash I don't think that she is still in business so because I wasn't able to find her website or anything so that's kind of sad because she does beautiful, beautiful things. And I think that she was based in Maryland. And yeah, it's so pretty. So these are, this is what the mini skein set looked like. And the colorway is called Dove in a Plum Tree. So, and the colors are Plume, which I guess is this uh, dark purple at the bottom. Dove, which I think is this gray one. Ume, Urchin, Hasta, and Walnut. So those are the colors. So pretty, I love this so much. So I knew that these colors were gonna look great together because of having them together in the minis game pack. And so I'm really, really pleased and I'm really glad that I was able to, to use these. So this is how mine is looking so far. It is going to block out quite a bit. I know it, it looks kind of small and a lot of the testers have been, oh no, uh-oh, uh-oh. Get that back on there, you stitch go on there. That was almost a disaster. Let's make sure it's on the needles. <laughs> um, a lot of the testers have been really concerned because even though they have been meeting gauge and checked their gauge and everything, um, they said it was fitting small. But then when people blocked it out, it grew a bunch. And so I knew that this was going to grow. So even though it looks kind of small here, I wasn't actually concerned at all because like uh, I've knit several of her designs. So, you know, like I love the way that her Tanya fits me. I just, I think it's perfect. And I, you know, I knew that the lacy part was going to block out. So I know that this is going to block out a whole bunch because it's lace and I, this part fits me perfectly so I actually even though everybody has been saying it fits small I am not at all concerned that this is not going to block out perfectly to the schematic dimensions so yeah this is the summer lacy lacy summer tea TBA named so it goes through um, I've got three more stripes to do in the same sequence and then the sleeves and the top of the sweater will be in this dark color. So that's uh, exactly what the colors are going to look like as it's knit up. And 
I love, love, love this test knit. This is such a great project. Um, yeah, I don't remember when it's due. I want to say it like 16th maybe. So I have like, I have more than a week. I have maybe two weeks, a little under two weeks still to get this done. Not worried about it. Um, I haven't really been actively working on it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna step up my production now that we are in June and get through the rest of those stripes, I think this week. And yeah, let's move on to my next whip because oh my goodness. Yeah. So let's talk about my Bright Axis Tea by Stephanie Lotvin. So this is from this book, Knit Happy with Self-Striping Yarn that Stephanie released earlier this year. And let me bring up the picture again for you guys. I really, really, really want to have this sweater as part of my wardrobe. So here it is, this is what it looks like. It's so, so, so cute. So last week when I was talking about this, I was holding it up and my, it was seriously like this wide. And if you guys saw last week, you know that I was like, doesn't this look like it's really, really, really big? And so typical me, I did not swatch because I just, I just don't tend to because most of the time, like 98.5% of the time, which is good enough for me, <laughs> I am right there. I am just using whatever needles they recommend and um, yarn, using whatever yarn and needles they recommend. I just, I'm just always right in the ballpark, if not exactly there, close enough that I know I can, I can wiggle it in the blocking process. So I don't usually swatch. Well, I had to rip it out because I decided after it was like, seriously looking this big, right? And I'm pretty sure that it's a super wash yarn that I am using, which is only going to grow. Even though it's a drapey sweat sweater, it's only supposed to have between four and 12 inches of positive ease. And just with it already being this wide, I was like, this is just, even for me, liking a lot of ease, this is looking a little bit extreme. So I, decided to finally get out my I had I had knit like maybe this much of it maybe a good six inches hundreds like 240 stitches six inches and so what uh, that was my swatch it was a really big swatch and uh, so I checked my gauge I was not on gauge at all I was like actually really far off I was Let's see, the gauge was 24 stitches and 32 rows per four inches. I was like 20 stitches, 19 to 20. I mean, that's a really, really, really big difference. And that's why it was so big because, yeah, 24 stitches out of 240. So that's a 10th. Of, so times 10, 24 stitches times 10 is your circumference, right? But seven, I would have to do the math, but 17, no, not 17, 19 or 20 stitches times 10 still then leaves me 40 stitches short and I times, you know, I'm not doing the math right, but you guys get what I mean. Like when you have fewer stitches when you have more stitches, now, fewer stitches than you're supposed to in the recommended gauge, that means you have to go down needle sizes because you've got to squish more stitches in there to meet that gauge. And if you have too many stitches than recommended, then you're knitting on needles that are too small for that gauge and then you have to go up a needle size. So I had only 20, which was too few stitches, which meant that mine was coming out way big. So I had to go down a needle size. So I did a swatch. 
just yesterday. I did a swatch. Look at this, guys. This is my swatch. Now, I, I did not make a tall swatch because I'm not worried about the row gauge because this is just stuck in it until however many inches. There's no kind of shaping or patterning or anything. So the row gauge is gonna be super easy to adjust for if I am off there. So I was only making sure I cast on 50 stitches to do my swatch. And let me just get this the right way because it kind of looks identical. That's the top and this is the bottom because I tied a little knot. All right, so this is my swatch. And I'm gonna show you what I did. So I cast on, I cast on 50 stitches because I needed to account for 24. So I figured that was like double plus two. And then I would be able to like take the measurement in a couple different places. So what I did, I did not wash and block my swatch. I'm not that, I just, I didn't feel like I needed to wash and block it because I know how a super wash yarn is going to react in the blocking process. So I knew that if I could just get close to the recommended stitch count, I could, if it was, you know, I could just block it exactly to how it was gonna need to be in the schematic. So I cast on 50 and I, I knit maybe like 13, 13 rows. And then what I did, so I knit in the round because it's a, it's a, it, I cannot talk. I knit my swatch in the round because my sweater is going to be knit in the round. And so your, your gauge can shift depending on if you're knitting flat with the purl stitches on the back or if you are knitting in the round. That can affect your gauge. So I did my, um, my swatch in the round. So you see all these strands here. I did not cut them in case I need to rip this out, in case I need extra yardage at the end of my project. Um, and then what I did was, so the bottom part, so the needle size record that she suggested in the pattern that she used for hers was a five, which is bigger than I usually knit for fingering weight yarn. So it does make sense that my sweater was coming out too big. So the bottom section below this row of purl bumps here, so to get that row of purl bumps, I just actually knit flat on the back. I just did knit stitches across the back and knit flat for one row. And then I switched needle sizes because I was like, all right, I'm way off. So am I gonna need to go down to a four or am I gonna need to go further down to a three? So I did a two in one swatch. So the bottom section here is knit with a four, a US four, and then the top section is knit with a US three. And so with the US three, I was actually getting closer to 25 stitches, which is a little bit too many. And the four, the US four, I was like between 23 and 24. So I was really close. Um, and I pinned it out because, you know, stockinette curls. So I actually, I just pinned this out so that it would lay flat on my little blocking board. And then I measured. And so I am going to I have decided to recast on and I'm going to use a size four. Um, I'm still doing the ribbing in a size three because I don't really feel like going down to a size two for the ribbing. I think a size three for the ribbing will be fine. So I cast on just as I did the first time. Um, <laughs> and you guys need to see this. Um, all I've done now is cast on again. So I cast on with a size three because the bottom inch is ribbing. And so I did, um, I did a long tail cast on and I've not joined it yet because I wanted to show you guys, look how close I came. Those last like three stitches were so hard for me to get on. I, I never, I know that there's a method to figuring out how much yarn you need for the long tail cast on so that you don't have either too few or too, or that's a wasp, either um, too little yarn, like run out of yarn or have like a huge extra amount at the end. I've just pretty much, as I, I just fly by the seat of my pants for these things. I just, I can't be bothered. I just kind of pull it out a bunch depending on how many stitches I have to cast on. I have, I've gotten pretty good at estimating. I cut it so, 
close to being just a few inches of yarn too short for my cast on. So this might be a little tricky to weave in later at the end, but I'm gonna make it work. I'm not gonna redo a 240 stitch cast on. So <laughs> I just wanted to show you guys that because it's, I mean, it's not yarn chicken, but it's like cast on yarn tail chicken. Is that a thing? So yeah, so all I did last night was, was just cast it on again. And so instead of, after I do the ribbing, which I'm doing also just on a three again, same exact thing I did the first time, instead of going up to a US five for the body, as she put in the pattern, I am only going to go up to a US four. And hopefully my sweater will still have positive ease, but not like two of me could fit in it. So yeah. I, it, it doesn't even actually bother me that I had to frog it because this was what I was using as my zoom knitting and you know, I, I just like having something in my hands to keep my hands busy while my brain is focusing on other things. So it served its purpose even though I had to frog it, it still served a purpose for me that I needed in a project at that time. So I'm not bothered about it. I just, I want to get the ribbing done again so that I can then have it going again as my, as my mindless knitting, my zoom knitting, you know, my, I don't need to think about complicated lace stitch patterns or color work knitting just to have it going. So that is the status of that. I am going to, all right. So now for Stephanie in her bright axis tee, she used her main color body and her stripey section of the yoke was the same exact dyer. Mine is not. So I actually, by the before I cast on Julia's yarn to do the stripes, I'm gonna do another swatch because um, it's it's a different it's a different yarn. It's a different company, and. I don't know if it's going to be a four or a different needle size that is going to be required to get that gauge. So there will be another swatch happening so that by the time I am ready to do the stripes, I don't mess it up at that point. So I will definitely be doing a swatch in this yarn as well. If it were the same exact yarn base, company, everything, I wouldn't feel the need to swatch again, obviously. But because this is a totally different yarn, I'm going to want to swatch since I was so far off the first time. So yeah, that is the update on my Bright Axis tee. So I've backtracked on that, but it should turn out much more within the realm of fitting like it's supposed to now. Okay, that is all of the knitting content I have for you guys today. I do not even have any acquisitions for you guys today. You guys, I just posted, um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't have, I still have more to show, to share with you guys. So don't sign off just yet. Um, but no acquisitions today. I just posted a video of our trip to the Long Island Fiber Festival. It used to be called the Long Island Fleece and Fiber Festival and Tabitha from Long Island Yarn and Farm, I guess founded it in conjunction with the Hallockville uh, Museum over there. And this year Tabitha has been touring with her llama shearing and everything. So she wasn't a part of it this year. So I didn't realize that until yesterday when I was putting uh, the, thumbnail, that's what it's called, the thumbnail together for my video, that it was actually not called the Long Island Fleece and Fiber Fair this year. It was called the Hallockville Fiber Fair. So I just called it the Long Island Fiber Fair, Hallockville, New York. Figured that kind of covered all my bases because if people wanted to search for it, they're going to know it by the previous name, what it's been called for the last handful of years that it's been going on. And they might not know to search for Hallockville Fiber Fair. So anyway, <laughs> I just posted a video today so by the time this comes out it'll have been up for like two days so if you haven't seen that video and want to have a little visit to a fiber festival a real live in-person event that was so fun it's been a while you know since 
most of us have done things live and in person. And so it was a really small festival. It's a pretty short video. Um, it is split, like half of the video is my trip to the festival and then the other half of the video is the acquisitions that I picked up at the Fiber Festival. So all of the acquisitions are in that video because they were relevant to that festival. So no acquisitions to share with you guys today, but I have been doing some natural dyeing. So we are going to move on to that now. Okay, so natural dyeing. You guys know that every once in a while I get inspired by the things in my own yard to dye my bare yarn with. And it's not something that I do on a regular basis, but um, dyeing, I had read recently that you can dye with things from an oak tree. And we have so many oak trees in our yard. But I also knew that you never want to mess with a live tree. Like you don't want to be picking bark off of the tree and leaves. You don't, you just, you know, mother nature does its thing for us. And over Memorial Day weekend, we had Saturday and Sunday. It just, it was really stormy weather. It rained and it was so windy. And so on Monday, um, the sun finally came out on Memorial Day and you know, we weren't doing we weren't doing anything So but Owen was home from school for the holiday obviously and so he was actually really really excited to help me pick up sticks and leaves and so We did my family has a yard a yard service that comes every Wednesday to do some cleaning up so um but we usually try to, when there's like a storm coming and stuff, you, we try to kind of get a lot of those big things just out of the way. But instead of pitching them over that fence back there that you see, cause it's all woods back there. So usually like our cleanup is just putting it over in the woods. Um, Owen and I went around and we collected a whole big, huge, he, he went overboard with what we collected way more than we needed but there were you know it it wasn't like you needed to get single leaves from the tree there were like these big clusters of branches that had like groups of leaves so i will insert a picture of like there's a video coming on this too um but we had like this huge pile of leaves that had fallen we had a huge pile of branches that have fallen and we even found just one but we found one oak gall what is an oak gall do you guys know what an oak gall is um i have heard of oak galls but you know i didn't know exactly what it was but i knew enough to know what to look for because i had it's it's like a natural mordant that you want to use you can get color from it but you also um so when you the natural dyeing process is Overall, it's more successful with protein fibers. So the fibers that come from animals, wool, um, alpaca, llama, you know, those types of fibers really take natural dyes super well. Sometimes you need to adhere, like go through the mordanting process, which is when you treat the yarn first so that, um, and usually this is done with something like aluminum sulfate, which is what I use when I mordant my animal fibers. Um, alum is what it's called for short. Usually we'll do, we'll do like a mordant in an alum bath. And what that does is it puts some kind of like coating on the yarn that helps adhere the color to it for longer. So you can get deeper colors that won't fade as quickly really hope I can beat the rain here. I'm going kind of long. I think I can. Um, but the, the oak gall is something that you can use to dye, to dye yarn. If you modify it with iron, you can get like a really deep gray or even a black depending. Um, and I've never tried to modify a color before, but the oak galls can be used to mordant plant based cellulose fibers like cotton for instance 
um, flax, things like that, that don't tend to absorb the color as well. For some reason, plant-based fibers are much harder to dye with the natural dyes. They just, they don't take the color as well. So the oak galls can be used as a mordant for those. So we found one oak gall. You need more than one. You want to have a handful. So I'm going to be on the lookout for them. You can purchase them. You can purchase all of these things. You can do like, I kind of like, I kind of call it like the cheaters version of natural dyeing. No dyeing is cheating, but for me, like you can go and purchase online the all of the natural dyes like in powder form and use them for your projects. You can, you know, they, they sell the natural dyes. So you can go at it that way. If you do not enjoy foraging yourself for the materials then, but you love the colors that natural dyes produce and you love the idea of being really organic with your dyeing, absolutely go buy natural dye powders. I probably will do that for things that are not easily accessible to me. But I, and I think part of it is because I have a six year old son and we're always looking for things to keep him busy. Um, I have found that I actually really enjoy taking what I can find myself and collecting those things. So Owen and I spent the whole day, we collected a whole bunch of oak leaves. He found one oak gall. We collected a whole bunch of oak bark from, <clears throat> excuse me, from fallen branches. And we made huge piles. I've got like two huge boxes full of branches, way more than we actually need. But you know, so um, I have not yet done the bark dyeing, but what I did do was we found some fallen lichen um, and I scraped, I spent like a whole afternoon like scraping lichen off of these fallen branches that had a significant amount of it. And so one thing that I am going to be doing, see there are some like, there's some big pieces in here. It's the green stuff, but there's also a lot of like just dust and powder and, and dirt. I'm not really sure how, how well this is gonna work, but there is a ton of lichen in here. There's some bark mixed in, so it's, um, but I had like a few, I'll insert some pictures because I had like some really good samples that we found. And it can be harder to get the lichen because you never want to take it off of the tree directly. And a lot of the best samples of it are higher up where you can't reach anyway. Um, but, so what I'm going to do, excuse me. But so what I'm gonna do with this is, if you soak this for like three to six months, so this is gonna take a while, and we'll shake this every once in a while on the podcast to see the color. I think that's gonna be really fun. What you wanna do is I need to go get some ammonia, some just clear, I found some at the store yesterday, but then it was lemon scented, and I don't want lemon scented. I just want plain, clear ammonia. So um, I need to go get some of that. But what you do is you fill the jar half full of ammonia and half full of water, and then you want to leave some space at the top of the jar um, because it has to also oxygenize. I think that's the right word, oxygenize. Um, and you shake it, and you just you let it sit. And every once in a while, maybe like once a week, you're supposed to just open the jar and let some oxygen come in. And then after like a couple hours or something, you can close it up again and give it a good shake and just leave it to sit. So this is gonna be a very slow dyeing process, but if it works the way that it's supposed to, I'm going to get something like maybe, maybe like this or or maybe like this, not exactly this purple, but like that kind of purple shade from this it's amazing i mean yeah so i am so excited to try this if i find better lichen samples i am going to be adding it to this jar um, especially before i add all the ammonia and water to it but i i'm hoping that there's enough i mean i spent like a whole afternoon like five hours scra scraping the lichen off of these branches uh, and pulling it off 
So I'm gonna like there's I see a really good one right there. Let me see if I can like grab one and show you guys like this one here. This is a, a great little sample. So this is like what it looks like. You guys have all seen this on your trees, right? So this is a really great sample because I was able to just pull this piece right off from the bark. Um, and like, here's here's another one. And I had some some much larger pieces like this, but then there were also like a lot of just parts where I just really had to scrape where I really just had to scrape it off the branches and it's kind of more in a powder form, but there's also some bark in there. So I don't know um, what effect the bark is going to have on the color. Um, because I think if you just purchase lichen, it's mostly free of the bark. So I'm really curious. I like experimenting. I like seeing what's going to happen. I bet you that I'm going to get a really interesting color out of this. But the dyeing that I did do this week was with the leaves because, all right, so with oak leaves, obviously you, in the fall, you're gonna have like all these brown and red and yellow leaves and everything. And you can, you, that'll give you one kind of color. Um, but I was reading, so I have the book, what is it called, Wild Color. And I think it's by Jenny Dean. I have a couple of books, but this is like the most comprehensive source. Um, so I definitely recommend this book. I'm going to link to it down below so you guys can check it out. I happened to find it at my local Barnes and Noble a couple of months ago and picked it up. And it is, it's like the best source that I have found so far and one that whatever research I've been doing like online, this book is always referenced. So I thought it would be a great one to have in my library. And um, she has a little chart of colors that show you what types of colors. Now, I mean, these vary depending on the area that you live in, whether you are using fresh material that you foraged or, you know, purchased a, a natural dye. Um, but it, it has a little chart giving you kind of a range of potential colors that you can get from you know all the flowers and plants and and things and so she had said that you can also use fresh oak leaves from like the spring and summer months and so you know we had all these leaves that were fallen and i said you know let's give it a try i've got five skeins of some bare naked yarn that I picked up that I showed you guys a few episodes ago that I picked up for to have on hand for dyeing and so I collected so we had so many leaves I ended up having like a large like a huge paper bag like one of those paper bags that you get at Target or something or like a grocery store bag like the large size of a paper bag and I had that completely filled with leaves I spent a couple hours chopping them up one night and then I let them soak in a dye pot in a dye pot overnight and then the next day because I had to go to bed the next day I simmered it for an hour and then I let it cool down and I let it sit overnight again before I took the leaves out because she said that you could either let the leaves soak for like three days about just in like cool water or you can kind of speed it along and heat it a little bit on the stove so I kind of did both I like I heated it up but I also let it let it sit I find that the longer you're able to let things sit in the dye bath the more color you can draw out of your material so I did that and then I put my yarn in it and I want to show you the color that we got from freshly fallen oak leaves from that tree over there which you can't see but I'll put a picture of that tree over there but a lot of the trees in this yard are oak trees and so I'm so excited it's not completely dry yet but look at this like look at this beautiful color so it's really still wet at the bottom I'm gonna have to reskein it because it got a little bit you know messed up in the in the dye bath but I, I did two skeins um, so I've got about 900 and two yards approximately of yarn that I dyed from my oak leaves in my yard. And I actually, I think that this kind of, it's kind of like a golden, like it's not yellow, but it's also 
not exactly tan or brown. It's like, it's like a, it's, it's kind of gold, but it's not like a yellow gold. Do you guys know what I mean? I don't know how this is going to show up on your, on your computer screens or anything, but I just, I think it is gorgeous. And I should also pop in a picture. Let me go get it actually. I, so I wanna, I'm really curious to see what these look like side by side. And I'm gonna be doing uh, side by side comparisons for you guys. But I do have some yarn that, um, not this past fall, but the previous fall. So the fall of 2019, Owen and I collected a bunch of acorns and we from the same oak trees and we dyed yarn with those acorns. So I'm gonna go get that really quick. And I just, I wanna, I'm really curious as I haven't done this yet. I'm really curious to see like what the acorn yarn looks like right up against these, the spring oak leaves yarn. So let's go get that and I will be right back. Okay, I was just waiting for the ice cream truck to go by. He comes too early. It's like not even two o'clock. School doesn't get out. Owen doesn't get home till four. He has been all week hoping for the ice cream man to come and he keeps coming at like two o'clock or earlier and the kids are not home from school yet. So I don't know what he's thinking. Anyway, I actually have all of this yarn that I dyed with acorns and I really want to hold these up side by side because they seem like they're kind of similar, but I think that they're going to be slightly different. Um, all right. So first, um, this one here, This one, yeah, is, uh, did I write on the label that I dyed this with acorns? I don't know if I did. Yeah, I did. Okay, good. Yeah, this is definitely yarn that I dyed with acorns, just to check. All right, so this one, gosh, I haven't looked at this in a while. I need to knit this stuff up. So this is some Patton's Classic Worsted yarn, just some Patton's uh, wool that I got at Michael's. And I dyed this with acorns in 2019, in the fall. Um, let's hold this up. I think it's different. I think this one looks more gold for sure. Yeah, it's definitely different. Can you guys see? Can you guys see the difference in that? So it's like they're similar, but they're different. And oh, this one definitely to me looks more yellow. And then this one, almost like a more orangey gold. I don't know. How would you guys describe this? How would you describe it? But there's a definite difference there. I mean, I think if you were looking at these separately, you might think that they were the same, but definitely, definitely I see a difference. Um, but I also dyed a lot of fingering weight yarn. So let's get that out as well. Let's put this over here. Watch over there. So this, I got a range of different ones because I think that what happened was I had so much of the dye bath and I had a whole bunch of the yarn. And so I, after I did like one dye bath, I went back and did a second one. Yeah, so this says acorns number one. So this is also some Patton's yarn, but this is the Croy sock yarn. And you can see how dark this one came out. And then in the same dye bath, I don't know, this one doesn't say anything, but it's all the same. It's all patents cry. In the same dye bath, you can see that um, it got much lighter. So what I did was these two I did first. And then instead of disposing of the dye bath water, I said, you know, there's so much color in here still. So then I put these three skeins in as well. So it's not exactly a gradient, but you can definitely see a difference in the depth of color from these three on the top and these two on the bottom. These are definitely more rich, more saturated color. And these, so these were all in the same dye bath. So there's, there's these, and then plus the worsted weight yarn. And I don't remember, this looks pale too. So I wonder, I don't think I put all of those in together. I might've done three dips, not really sure. I had so many acorns, but I definitely only made one dye bath. 
So we got worsted weight, and then I have all of this fingering weight. And I don't really know yet what I'm gonna make out of it. But let's hold this up also. So this should be really similar. So yeah, I mean, you can see it's different. It is not the same, but it comes from the same tree. So that's really cool. The other thing that I need to mention that was really cool about doing this, I was talking about using a mordant before to pre-treat your fiber. Um, with the acorns and with any of the oak tree, you don't have to because the tannins in the acorns and the tannins in the leaves and the bark contain, a, a tannin is, I don't know the exact definition of it, but like avocados and some, some things naturally produce tannins, which automatically make the color adhere to the yarn. I don't know, I, I am learning, but I'm not like an expert or any kind of, um, I, I'm just, I'm learning. I don't know all the correct terminology to explain this stuff. It's, I mean, it's, it's chemistry really, and it's very scientific stuff. Um, but yeah, let's just take one of each of these now. That one is connected. So let's get one out of the label. So I just want to see. So the darkest one. Anyway, you don't have to pre, that's what I was trying to get at is when, when something is rich of tannins, you do not have to mordant the yarn. It has enough um, of whatever the tannin, the naturally tannin in it to absorb the color really well. So this is the most saturated yarn from the acorns up against the oak leaves. So I think that you guys can see, I see a pretty big difference here. This, the leaves is a much, a much lighter and different, different shade. It's, they're, they're both golden, but in much different, in a different way. And then, the lighter one over here, this is the lighter acorns. So even those, like they're two different colors. Like you would clearly in the store, if you were trying to match a dye lot, you would definitely not put these two together because you would say, okay, those are really different. So different material, same tree. I just think it's fascinating. I love I, I, if you, if you told me, if you told me a few years ago even, or when I was in my 20s or 30s, that one day I would be scraping stuff off of branches and collecting sticks and acorns and leaves and stuff and doing things with them to like make dye for yarn, I'd have looked at you like you were nuts. I. I, I was never that kind of girl growing up, I don't think, where I just was interested in sticks and leaves. I mean, oh my goodness. Just, yeah, and especially scraping lichen off of a branch because I could get color from it. We were, it was actually our neighbor's tree that the oak gall came from, and it was, it was probably from our tree because it hangs right over their fence, and this was in the front yard, so we were, we were talking with them, and I just, I looked down and I said, oh my goodness, can I have this? And he was like, well, what is that? Oh, and I, so let me go get it. Okay, so this is the oak gall that, that we found, and this was, this was across the fence, but from our tree, and you know, my neighbor was like, yeah, you can have that. I don't even know what it is. Like, what is it? And my, my family, nobody knew what an oak gall was. I was like, that's an oak gall. I guess it's also called an oak apple. Okay, and so this is so cool. I'm learning about this. This is the thing I was talking about that you can use also to dye and to mordant your plant-based fibers. And so you'll see that there's a hole in there. This is the larva from the, a wasp not like the big wasp. I guess there's some kind of wasp that's like pretty small. I guess there's like a lot of varieties of wasp. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of varieties of everything, but you know, I just think of a wasp as being like the one that flies around and stings you like 
I have like right near me right now. Um, but apparently there's some kind of wasp that um, what they do is the female lays an egg on a leaf of a tree which causes the leaf to transform and grow into this kind of thing, which goes around the eggs. And one wasp, a single wasp, I think is what it is, will, will develop inside this. And then it comes out when it reaches adulthood or like when it's ready to be a wasp out in the world or something. And this is what is left and they you can see like it was attached to the tree from that little bump and so these form on the leaves and it kind of like it mutates part of the leaf to this thing so it's called either an oak apple or an oak gall g-a-l-l -L. and a wasp is it is like developing in here and then they sometimes fall down or get blown down and they are wonderful sources of tannins. So yeah, so if you ever see these things, you guys can mail them to me. I will take them. I know that sounds really weird. I was like, I know I'm your crazy neighbor who's like picking up sticks and looking for these weird things. And yeah, I'm gonna like boil my, my sticks. And <laughs> so anyway, I think it's, I feel like the rain is starting to kind of come and yeah this is about all I've got to share with you guys this week it's kind of a lot I don't know it's certainly different than usual so let's see I have a whole bunch of sticks I'm it's gonna be raining today and then I think tomorrow is going to be sunny again so tomorrow I am going to get my sticks back out of the garage and work on chopping up I need to get to the inner part of the bark because the inner part of the bark is where like most of the color is for the dyeing. So I need to kind of like pick it apart and chop it up a bit and then I'll be creating a dye bath out of that. And I have three, I think I'm gonna do three skeins for that one because I have three skeins left. Sorry, there's a cat like chasing a bug and it's really cute. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think I'm gonna probably do all three skeins in the fingering because it's another fingering weight yarn it's going to be exactly this uh, same base and that way I'll have enough for a sweater and I think it's going to also give me a beautiful color that is going to be similar to this but different um, and I have recently found uh, a youtuber and his name is cabin boy knits and he's um, he lives, I don't know where he lives, but he lives like out in the woods and he forages for himself, for himself too and does natural dyeing. And I have watched a couple of his videos now. He has one video where he did it in the fall where he did uh, the bark from the oak tree, the fall leaves, and then he did a third one. What was the third one that he did? He did the leaves and he did the bark. He did something else, oh, the acorns. Maybe it was acorns, that was it, yeah. He did leaves, bark, and acorns in the fall. Um, so if I'm gonna try to link, I'll try to remember to link below to his video, but that was really cool to watch. So he had like, he was outdoors, he had like three huge dye pots and he had a whole lot of yarn that he was dyeing. So I don't know if he sells it, he might. I know that I had heard of him through Christy Glass Knits, like, years ago but i had never like i didn't know he had like his own channel or anything so i am like really interested in following along with him and seeing the different natural dye projects that he does i just think it's so cool when the people forage for the stuff themselves like from what is local right around them um i mean i can't really get any more local than my own yard here it's just as close as i i can get um yeah, so I am going to be putting together, I've already started filming the video, so there will be a separate video going through the whole process of dyeing um, both the leaves and the bark for the oak tree. So I've got the leaf footage almost done now, and then as I dye the bark this week, I will be 
filming that and then in another week or two there will be a video out showing all of that and the difference between the bark and the leaves and then I mean this is gonna be a slow one this this one's gonna be months and months and months so I think um, you know I'm gonna get some ammonia and some water in there really soon and then I think every once in a while on the podcast we'll give it a shake and we'll see how the color is developing it's supposed to turn into like a really dark kind of like a red first but then like an even deeper purple um, so you just have to be patient so yeah I think we will as much as I podcast outside I will get my jar and we'll shake it and we will see how that color is transforming but that is everything I have for you guys this week I think I already started to wind this down and then I just kept talking as one does so um, if you liked this video please give me a thumbs up we are getting so close to 2,000 subscribers now it is so exciting um, and I really appreciate every one of you. Please leave me some comments. I love chatting with you guys in the comments. And if you have not yet subscribed, I would very much appreciate you hitting that subscribe button. And until next time, have a great everything. Bye-bye.